been one of the biggest issues in technology over the last year, with several high-profile breaches reported, bug bounties scrutinized, and third-party access examined. Next up, a man responsible for securing the personal data of many millions of Uber riders. Please welcome to the stage, in conversation with Alicia Newcomb of NBC News, Uber's Chief Information Security Officer, John Flynn. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a lot to talk about. It's yeah. been a pretty busy six months <laughs> since Uber first disclosed its data breach. Um, but I want to back up and ask the easy question first. Why are you called Four? Yes. Why is that your nickname? Yeah, so uh, my friends call me Four. And the reason is, is my name is uh, actually John Flynn IV. And uh, I used to, when I was going to school, uh, I was working my first security job, and everybody there, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but everybody there had the same name. They were all called John. And so they started giving everybody different unique nicknames, probably numbering us. Uh, and so I ended up with four, because it's my name. So. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Not a golfer. Not a golfer, no. <laughs> um, so the past six months have been pretty big when it comes to data privacy and how we're starting to think about our data and what we're putting out there, who owns it, how it's being handled. Are you feeling a shifting expectation from customers on your end? And if so, how are you handling that? Yeah, I think, I think it's a good question. I mean, I think, look, you know, security, it's hard to imagine, you know, if you look back six, 12 months, security's been in the news, seeming, seems like every day, security or privacy. And I think, you know, I've been doing security actually for quite a while, since almost beginning of security as a discipline. And, and there has been a, a change, Alyssa, I've noticed actually over the last uh, six months in particular. So I think if you look back a year or more ago, I think what, what we saw is that there was a lot of concerns about data breaches, a lot of concerns about security and protections that companies were placing on, on data. And I think what we've seen, especially in the last few months, is really a focus on not just security, but also privacy as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what we've noticed is that, uh, you know, especially on the customer side, the consumer side, the set of expectations I think that people are having um, is evolving quite a bit. And so I think people are now at a place where they're expecting companies to do even more on their behalf as far as protecting uh, their data. Now, one thing I, I want to note, though, on this, I think it's important for especially this audience to understand. I've been doing security, like I said, a little while. One of the things I've noticed is that customers tend to not do a great job in protecting their own data or protecting their own selves. And so I think while we've seen this evolution of uh, uh, you know, expectations on companies, we still haven't seen customers you know, picking stronger passwords or making sure they're enabling the protections and so forth. So I think you know, people like me that are designing the security systems into the, into the consumer apps, I think it's important to remember that um, you know, we still have to do a lot on the behalf of the user and their expect while their expectations are rising, um, you know, their behavior hasn't changed a whole lot. So how do you design security controls that people can fill and use and know that they're there protecting them? Yeah, I think this is a, uh, a, a challenging problem. But I think you know, we, we use a principle that we call uh, security by design. And the way that works is you know, when somebody logs in to the app or when they're using the app, we make sure that we also have uh, a number of different protections in place. So for example, if somebody's account does get compromised, of course, we don't want that to happen. And we have a bunch of protections in place to avoid that uh, occurrence. But when it does, we make sure that the, the app itself and the, and the ecosystem has a number of protections in place. So you know, a simple example, but a good one, is that you know, if somebody logs into your Uber account, uh, we want to make sure they can't see your credit card information, for example. And it's, it's just the, 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 you build a security by design by thinking of a number of different ways to protect things um, as part of the experience. So I, I'm sure a lot of you, like myself, have downloaded your Facebook or your Google histories. If I want to download my data from Uber or find out what Uber has on me, is there a way I can do that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, like I, one of the things I wanted to, to, to mention about this is that uh, you know, as part of this evolution of privacy expectations mm -hmm. that we were just talking about, Alyssa, I think it's a, a really good point. Because what we see is that customers are actually uh, you know, uh, demanding a higher set of privacy expectations. So, so we've added another layer where we think about what we, what we call privacy by design. Mm -hmm. um, and what that is, is, sort of similar to security by design, is that we make sure that as we're building products and as we're building experiences, customers are in control. Yeah. 
So this is one of the things we've been hearing a lot from our customers, and I bet a lot of the people in this room know what I'm talking about, is that there's an expectation uh, by customers now that they're, that, that they're in control of their data, mm -hmm. they're in control of the experience. And so you know, for a couple of years, we've taken the approach internally of building a lot of security and privacy in the background, behind the experience. Um, you know, for example, uh, I actually built Uber's privacy engineering team, you know, I think almost two years ago now, uh, doing a lot of work in the back end on customer privacy. But what we've heard, especially in the news, as you, you, you mentioned, is that there's an expectation that the customers can engage with that. So we have a concept we call, uh, you know, uh, security you can feel, privacy you can feel. So we now know it's not enough to just put those experiences on the back end of the, of the app, um, you know, behind the scenes, getting out of the customer's way. That's important too. But I think what we've seen is that customers actually want to engage. They want to have settings. They want to have control. They want to feel empowered as part of the experience. Um, and that's, that's one of the things we've been spending a lot of time on. And you're also working to implement two-factor authentication for people, is correct? Yeah, yeah. So let me, let me explain uh, a little bit. This is just a little bit of a subtle point. So on Uber, you know, w when you log in, we actually have, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Because for, for years, we've actually had this two-factor authentication uh, behind the scenes. So if you log in from a new device, for example, you get a new phone, you lose your phone, uh, we actually do multi-factor authentication prompt you with a text message uh, so that we can validate that it's really you. Uh, but what we've seen, like I said, in talking to our users, is that there's actually more, uh, uh, more that people want to see. And so we're, we're also working on a refinement to that process um, that allows users to actually have that experience always on. And so, for example, not just when they get a new device, but also if they log out or log in on that same device. And just a lit another added layer of protection. Again, just showing ways that customers can engage in the security and privacy of the ecosystem. I think that's the big takeaway I would have for all of you from this conversation, is that you know, I, I've been doing this a while, and I think as you're building these experiences at your own companies, making sure that you're providing mechanisms by which customers can engage uh, with consent or with protect, you know, the various aspects of their security and privacy story, it goes a tremendous amount of way to building trust with your customer base. Definitely, and I mean, on that note, thinking about myself as an Uber passenger, I'm curious, what kind of data points do you hold on passengers in the app? Yeah, I mean, we we uh, we we have a number of different data points that that we use as part of enriching the customer experience. I think one of those uh, things is, of course, your profile information. Um, and then, um, you know, we do have some information about the trips uh, that you take as well. Yeah. Great. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about the data breach. That was a tough time for Uber. Um, you testified before Congress. Um, several of your colleagues departed. I wanted to ask, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from that? And what advice would you give to another company that might find themselves in the unfortunate, unfortunate circumstance of going through that? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, they, uh, uh, they had a, a tagline for the, the, the volunteer service, and it was called, the toughest job you'll ever love. <laughs> I don't know if anybody, that rings true for any of our audience here, but I have a feeling that sounds familiar. Uh, so I think we have learned a lot of lessons from that experience. Um, it's been, we've had some challenging times, but I think what, what we've learned is, is made us a lot stronger. So the first thing I'll mention is, you know, the event itself, we had a uh, really strong security team in place for, for many years now, something I'm really proud of. So, you know, we've built one of the world's best security teams at Uber, um, and I'm, you know, I really believe that to be true. Uh, and, you know, we, we actually handled that, that situation in the moment quite well in terms of the technical response, which is what I was responsible for. I think the big thing that we learned was that we, we needed to do a better job being transparent, and we needed to tell our, our, both our users and our regulators more details about what we were seeing on the platform. And so going forward, you know, those, those lessons are something we're taking to heart. And we're, we're being a lot more transparent by doing things like uh, updating our bug bounty terms, for example, uh, to make it clear where the lines are for people that are reporting through the program um, so that, the, you know, we can make sure that there, there's, it's very clear what the, what the lines are in terms of how their behavior should be. The other things that we've done is making sure that we bring in all the right uh, people into the conversation anytime there isn't a security event internally throughout the company. And the last thing I'll say, and this is something that I think um, maybe many of you will face sometime in your careers, is that you know, we, if there is something that happens or there is a security problem, um, obviously you want to make sure you do a great job you know, preventing any more damage or any more risk to your customers, but also you want to be sure you're transparent and, and with your public and also with the, the, the various regulators as well. 
And so for going forward, we're very much committed to having that ongoing dialogue with regulators and being very clear with, the, with our customers about what's going on on the platform. And can you talk to me a bit about how Uber uses bug bounty platforms? Yeah, so I don't know, how many of you show of fans have heard of bug bounty programs? You guys know what it is? Yeah, wasn't sure uh, about this audience, about half, maybe a third. So bug bounty programs are an important part of what we call the secure software development lifecycle. So not to get too technical, but essentially the notion is you're building software, you're building systems, you're building products, right? Something you're all familiar with. One of the things you want to make sure you don't do is you tack on a bug bounty program at the end. So that, what a bug bounty program is is a way for you to get folks around the world to participate in finding bugs, finding flaws in your systems to help make sure that you're not missing anything in your security review. But what, the important part that I think a lot of people setting these programs up miss is that it's, it's, it's not enough to just tack it on the end and not have a robust security apparatus to begin with. It has to be part of the way that you build products. Just like privacy, security, they both have to be part of the development process from the beginning of how a product works. So when somebody's conceiving of an idea, my team is actually in there having a conversation with the product managers and the engineers to say, is this really a good idea? Is this the right way to use people's data? Is there some security flaws in this, in this design? And I think once you think of, have that mindset going in, then you can engage in the beginning, and then the bug bounty program is an add-on on the end that helps you catch anything that that first process might have missed. And that's where bug bounty programs are tremendously valuable. We've had, we, you know, we've had tremendous success with the program, Alyssa. Uh, specifically, we've, had, uh, we've paid out over, I think, $1.4 million, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to, to people, researchers trying to find uh, cha uh, you know, problems in our bugs. We've got people reporting all over the world, almost as many people in India as in the United States, you know, helping us find uh, these flaws that we may have missed. It's an incredible success story. And are these a lot of times tiny, tiny things yeah. that you just otherwise wouldn't have known about? That's exactly right. So, you know, er, you know we, we, might, we get everything from the, the tiniest thing to something rather, you know, some more important, which happens a lot more rarely. But it, 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 it's a nice check and balance against that whole process. And the other thing I'll say that, we, that we, I think we're, not, we're doing a great job at is, you know, it, it's not enough to just get those reports, mm -hmm. handle them, and then call it a day. I think if you do your job right, you can actually take the learnings and lessons from those reports and the themes that you're seeing and help actually pivot that into technical things that you can do inside your company or trainings to enrich the, the, the company, uh, company's support for security. That's another thing that we've had tremendous success with is you know, saying, look, we've seen this class of flaws or we've seen this, this, this sort of class of bugs. How can we turn that into a training process and drive that down from the beginning of the process? Uh, it's it's very really, very valuable, uh, you know, part of the part of the ecosystem. Um, so Dara joined as Uber's new CEO, I believe, sometime last fall, and I'm wondering if you can talk to me a bit about how things are changing under new leadership mm -hmm. when it comes to how the security team operates. Definitely, yeah. So um, you know, Dara's come in, and you know, one of the things that I've been really so I, I've been really impressed with his work, to be honest. One of the things that I've really been uh, admired him for is that he's really cal calmed things down quite a bit. I think you know you remember last year where we had you know news stories in the press quite a bit and things that we were uh, the things that were going on. And I think you know things like settling the Waymo lawsuit, for example. Uh, you know he's just had a really steady hand on making sure that we're focused on the things that really matter, which is making sure that our riders can get around in the cities that they're living in and uh, you know get the food deliveries and so forth. Um, and so that, to me, internally has really made a big difference in my daily life and my team's daily life in terms of focusing on the things that really matter, making security better, protecting data, things like that. Uh, so there have been billions of Uber rides. Uh, don't even know how many passengers around the world, but it seems like pretty much everyone I know has Uber and has taken an Uber ride. You have a pretty big job. Is it daunting at all to think about the fact that so many people are trusting you? with their data and their security? A little. Um, <laughs> but, you know, look, l let me tell you all a story about why I joined Uber and why I'm still at Uber, because I think it's important to understand the context of, of the answer to your question. So, you know, I joined Uber coming up on three years ago now, and, uh, you know, things have changed quite a bit at the company, but the, the core tenet of why I joined and why I'm still there is not, not different. Uh, you know, I, uh, I've spent a lot of my life working on security, protecting people's data, and, and doing the hard job of defense uh, and, you know, of people's data. And I think what I've, what, what, one of the things that I've, I was enticed by by Uber was the notion that I can make a difference at this intersection between the physical and the digital worlds 
uh, in a way that I, I didn't see an opportunity in, in the same visceral way at other companies. So, you know, every day there's people getting in cars, uh, they're, they're, they're going around cities in the real physical world, and, you know, doing this job, uh, frankly, makes me feel like I can make a difference in making that experience better and making that experience a little bit uh, safer. And, uh, you know, honestly, that matters a lot to me. And, you know, like we said, we've had our ups and we've had our downs, uh, but I'm still very bullish on the future of the company, and uh, I still am very proud to work there because of those reasons. I feel like I can make a difference in the world. I was going to ask you about the best part of your job, but I think you might have just answered that, All right? Well, there are other, other things that I would mention there as far as my job goes. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is the level of absolute unbelievable talent that we have at Uber, uh, and how everybody that I know that I work with is extremely passionate about the mission of the business. Um, you know, this notion that uh, we, can, we can work with cities and make, make, make them better, that we can uh, help make the world a better place by unlocking transportation opportunities for you know, various folks around the world. Um, you know, women in Saudi Arabia, for example, are, are able to get around now uh, you know, because of the changing in laws in the country, but of course, Uber is there to support them as well. It's just you know, a million stories like that every day of you know, people that are blind or people getting to the hospital when they didn't have anybody else to care for them. I mean, honestly, it's... Um, Everybody in the company is aligned by making the world a better place and by making, making a difference. And it, it, it just, it's, it's really just amazing. One minute left to go. I wanted to ask if you had one piece of security advice when it comes to how we're treating our data, how we're protecting it, um, what would it be? Yeah, it's, it's, this one's easy. I've done, so I worked at Google, I worked at Facebook, I worked at Uber. I've been at all those places at just the inflection point between being a small company and becoming a huge multinational corporation. And the one common theme I've noticed from my career is that people miss getting the stuff right from the beginning. So if you're working at a startup and it seems like you don't have time to work on security or you don't have funding, uh, don't make that mistake. Get the architecture right, get the products right, think about privacy from the beginning. You're gonna be very, very thankful that you got it right early on. Great. Well, thanks, for for yeah. taking the time to chat, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everybody.